I shared some isometric art recently online. Some of you requested that I make a longer process video on it, so here we are. It all really starts off with an idea. I have this little dwarf character called Lumber who you might recognize from older videos if you've seen those. I'm always trying to develop the story that I have for him and his universe or what I like to call the Lumberverse. In a recent video I shared a little teaser for a new character, the little wizard that I've got here. So for this piece I had in mind to share where the wizard lives in a wizard's tower. I usually start off with little doodles and notes in a notepad, just scribbling away, trying to generate ideas. If I'm struggling to come up with ideas, I usually just ask myself questions about the world itself. What kind of character is the wizard? Where would he live? What kind of environment would he live in? What type of things does he do? And those questions, I think, really help form a stronger idea. At some point, I do have to stop asking questions about it and just start creating it. Otherwise, I'd end up drafting out the whole world, which I've already done, by the way. So if you're interested in the Lumberverse, we're only just getting started. Part of the process which I think is quite vital is gathering reference. Usually I'm looking for two types of reference. The first type is sort of a mood or inspiration board, which kind of helps me explore different ideas, decide on the tone I want to set for the piece. I just gather images from online, you know, Google images, Pinterest, and put them all into a pure ref board. Pure ref is a free software, by the way, I'd highly recommend it. I usually do the mood or inspiration board at the start because it helps me push that initial idea. The second type of reference is detail or technical reference, which really helps when I've never drawn a certain subject before. For example, if I was to ask you to draw a crocodile, you might not know how to do that accurately, but if you first gather reference and do some exploration sketches, you'll probably be able to draw a much better crocodile. The more reference gathering and studying that you do, the less you'll actually have to rely on reference in the future. So in this case, I wanted the wizard's tower to be sort of a medieval building and tower, but I've never drawn it before, so I just gathered some reference for it. It's not about copying any of the reference directly, it's more about learning and exploring a specific subject so that you can help expand that visual library that you've got in your mind. So after getting an idea and gathering some references, the first part of my creation process is to do some exploration sketches to really help me learn the subject matter that I'm going to be drawing. And it's not about being perfect here. A lot of people ask me what canvas size I start out with and it's usually just an experiment. I think the more you do pixel art, the more you learn about what kind of detail you can fit into certain sizes. But for my process, I'm trying to keep it quite fluid. If I need to expand or shrink the canvas at any point, I can and it's not a big deal. So for the rest of the exploration sketch, I keep checking back and forth with the reference here, just trying different things out. At first it's kind of like putting together a puzzle, like you don't know which parts fit with what. The more comfortable I get with it, the less I actually need to rely on it. So I can get more creative and start thinking more about the design of the piece. The basic idea is here with this one, but for me there wasn't enough unique shapes and it kind of just didn't fit with the rest of the house. At this moment it looked like a building and a tower, two separate elements instead of one thing. But it's no issue, I just delete it and try again. Increase the canvas size again, this time ending up with a 240 pixel by 240 pixel canvas, each grid size being 18 pixels by 9 pixels. This time I try to really focus on each building at a time and design it properly using basic shapes. From the reference, I really like this sort of unbalanced, unstable and quirky looking building. I thought that would represent like a, a loopy wizard character really well. So I try to use that for the main building, made out of cubes and a triangular roof shape. When I moved on to the tower, I try and match that main building by using similar shapes and design elements. Some of these things are kind of intuitive when I'm drawing, like something just doesn't look right or it looks out of place, but I also find it helps to stop the sort of doodle nature and actually start thinking while I'm drawing too. So for the tower, I get this cube base with a triangular roof which matches the building, and then I get that unbalanced tower with the, the cube room on top. At first, I was just going to have this isolated platform and decorate it with things that I thought might surround the wizard's house. A little portal for traveling, trees, fences, and a little pond with ducks in it which is sort of spilling over the sides and maybe a little bench to just sit and observe the world or something. I was originally going to have just this single platform but I wanted to try having these floating platforms around it because I think that would be a little less pristine and more chaotic which I think would represent the character a bit better. This actually presented a new challenge in composition, like where do I place the other platforms in order to make the whole piece feel balanced. But basically the more I added to one side, I kind of just tried to balance that with adding things on the other side, all while trying to keep the main tower the main focus of the piece by not adding too much detail to the outside. Once I was basically happy with the sketch, it's then time to add a new layer and start constructing it all. I tried freehanding it at first, but I just really didn't like that approach. I kept feeling like I was losing control, so I tried to construct the image using basic shapes. This was actually my first ever isometric pixel art piece, but not to lead anyone astray here, I actually did so much research on pixel art isometric construction beforehand. I'm not going to be going into how I constructed the basic shapes of isometric pixel art, but all of the things that I learned, tested, and refined during my research, I compiled it all into a super simple guide for beginners 
which you can check out here. All of those construction tips are used in this piece here, starting with the basic shapes and then just building it up. Because it was my first large isometric piece, I actually started it over a couple of times because I found myself losing track. Color coding each shape helped a lot to distinguish which area I was working on and also to see how those basic shapes fit around each other. Each shape was in separate layers as well, so you'll see me hide some shape layers as well so that I can focus on other parts of the piece, like the roof, which was actually quite complicated. When I was more comfortable with the construction, I changed all the outlines to black and started to merge them all together so that I could add more detail. So at this point, I'm starting to add detail to each section. I found this to be really easy when I had the base structure in place because I can use those existing lines as reference and just add on to it. All of that research in the reference and exploration sketches earlier really helped out at this point because it made me really comfortable when deciding on what details to add to the buildings without having to constantly check the references. You can definitely see similarities between the reference that I was searching and the wooden structures that I put in this building as well. Building that visual library was really key to avoiding some of that frustration here. Saying that, I did struggle with some areas a couple of times. You'll see me deleting the tower because I just wasn't happy with it. But usually when I struggle with one part of a piece, I move on to something else and come back to it. Eventually. When I don't have a choice. <laughs> So I focused on some of the easier parts like the portal, the path, details in the house, the pond and the surrounding areas. I find those explorative elements a lot more fun and creative generally. So that was a nice break from isometric construction. I definitely didn't do this all in one sitting either. This was made over the course of a week and I find it really helps to take a break, especially if I'm getting frustrated. I'll go for a walk or come back to it another day with fresh eyes. By then, I usually have a better idea of how to solve the problems when I get back to it. Like that pesky tower, which was actually no problem after I took a break. And then I could have some more fun again by adding some more detail into that area. You'll see my process shift a little bit too, actually. I think isometric art can be really clinical and precise, especially when you're constructing parts. And that was definitely the approach when constructing the house and the first part. But as I was designing areas, I kind of let loose a bit more and just started sketching more roughly. The rough trees on the platform, the shape of the platform, which I imagine to be this layered sedimentary rock with floating rock pieces hanging off it. I find doing some rough sketches to be quite fun sometimes, and it's good for getting ideas down quickly. But when it comes to putting those elements in and and cleaning it up, I went back to the precision from before, which is actually quite relaxing to just clean things up as you go along. Figuring out the tiles for the house was a nightmare at first, but I figured the best way to do it was to just create one section and then offset the different sections, copy and pasting throughout. I find it generally easier to make patterns through copy and pasting things. For the trees, I just started off with a cylinder and a cone for the main section. I added in little asymmetrical details because I think that makes something look a bit more interesting than just plain symmetry. Once I had one tree, I could just copy and paste them for the rest of the trees in the scene. I usually jump around different areas like clean up one part, see something else that I want to clean up and just keep jumping around the piece until it's more cleaned up. You'll see I measure the distance between the sediments on the rock to keep that consistent through the scene as well. It's little measurements like that which can help make things seem more cohesive. When putting the grass from the top of the platforms, you'll see that I took some inspiration from some of the references that I found earlier. I really like that uniform grass pattern. I thought that looked really clean and provided some nice visual contrast against the sort of chaotic and organic rock structures below. I also cut off some pixels from the top of the grass line to make that edge seem more soft instead of a sharp, clean edge. For the smoke on top of the house, I went for a more organic look too, so it contrasted the clean, precise nature of the constructed isometric house. Try to make it so that it framed the house nicely without getting in the way too much. I'm still coming back and forth and messing with that wizard's tower. I added another little chimney to the right hand side because that just felt a little bit unbalanced to me. I thought having multiple chimneys is quite quirky as well. It's like he's doing too much magic up there or something and needs the extra chimneys to help out. I continue to refine and clean up the piece, adding little mushrooms and rocks to the grassy areas. I did this until I was basically happy with the line work. It's not finished at this point, but it's good enough where I can start doing some color roughs. Color is super important, so before I jump into it and just add them in, sometimes I like to do little color roughs to get a better idea of the atmosphere that they're going to bring to the piece. These are super quick as well. I don't spend a lot of time doing these, but it helps a lot. For the first color rough, I had in mind this sort of cartoon fairy tale setting, which would be very vibrant. And all the things would be colored very obviously. The grass is green, the sky is blue. It's unrealistic, but I think it's good for a nice fantasy setting. For the second color rough, I wanted to try a nighttime scene using the complementary colors purple and yellow, with the purple being the more dominant color here and the yellow being more of an accent color. I still wanted to give an indication of the local color of the green grass and the local color of the brown dirt, but they're not actually green and brown at all. They're just really desaturated purples and blues, quite close to gray on the color picker. When you put these neutral grays against the more saturated colors, it pushes their sort of perceived color to the opposite side of the color wheel. So if you want a really dominant colored scene, still with some color variety, you don't have to go to all ends of the color wheel. Just play around with those neutral grays and you'll find you can give an indication of different hues. 
you might find that it'll look a lot more cohesive instead of using saturated colors everywhere. While I liked the nighttime one, it wasn't quite what I had in mind. So I went back to the daytime scene for the last one, this time keeping the complementary color idea. So this time I was using orange and blue. I still kept some other vibrant and saturated colors in there, but this felt quite welcome, warm and earthy. So I decided to go with this one. The same we start off colouring in with flat values. This is because I usually start in black and white value first because you get a lot of control over lighting and it can help you build up the 3D form properly. But I actually changed my mind this time and took a colour first approach. I must have been feeling confident that day or something. There are positives and negatives to different approaches and I usually find that with a colour first approach I get much more vibrant colours overall. But it's super easy to lose control of the value structure so I knew I'd have to keep checking the values throughout. So I start with putting in the flat colours in for everything. Try to keep all my colours limited at first. Now, adding in too many and I put all the different colors on separate layers so I can easily adjust them if I need to. I'm constantly tweaking colors and experimenting. I really never get it right the first time so having that control to change them when I want is really important for my process. I didn't want the outlines to be so harsh so I colored them a darker version of the color they were surrounding. The roof became a darker reddy orange for example to match the tiles. The process to adding shadow for colors is pretty straightforward. I first defined the light source. In this case it was to the very far left. Most likely sunlight here and then I add in a new layer for applying the shadow. I usually play around with the layer modes to find which one works best for me. For this piece I use the multiply layers for shadows and just reduce the opacity until I thought it looked alright. And I keep the same shadow colour throughout, just messing with the opacity. And then I can easily tweak this later on when I'm refining the piece. Refinement is probably my favourite part of the whole process. It's when everything finally starts to come together and you get your first glimpse of how the piece is going to look when it's done. To refine it, I usually just go through adding different colour details and colour variety throughout. You can easily add colour variety by having different hues in one section of the piece. In the sedimentary rock, for example, it isn't just one colour, it's multiple colours. And it was important to make sure these weren't high contrast against each other so they didn't steal any of the focus of the piece. And the same goes for colouring little details too. The mushrooms, the rocks, the ducks in the pond, they're not meant to distract you or take away your focus. They're just there to help build the world and add more interest to the area. Throughout this whole thing, I wasn't really happy with the clouds surrounding the area. It looked out of place, didn't fit that isometric view, and made the scene look tightly packed and claustrophobic to me. So I deleted them. Even though I'm in refinement and it's close to the end, I find it really important to be flexible and not treat the work too preciously either, so that I can improve it if I need to. I played around with adding some more isometric shaped clouds, but I wasn't really feeling it. I was actually making this live on Twitch and I asked the chat for some feedback and I'm sure someone mentioned adding the wizard to the scene and I really wanted to open up the space as if you were in the sky so I tried just adding more platforms and the bottom left hand corner seemed like the perfect place to just plonk down a character that's looking over the whole place. But instead of using the wizard, I decided to add lumber. I thought this moment could be part of his adventure where he finally makes it to the wizard's tower. He's just relaxing and taking it all in. It really helps to ask for feedback and Twitch chat is the real MVP here. Let's get some hype in the chat! <laughs> Before I finished off adding lumber to the scene, I continued to refine the scene by using colour adjustments. Adding some more colour variety for interest, thinking about using saturation as contrast to lead the viewer's eye to the main focus of the piece, which in this case is the tower. I took a break and when I came back I realised some of the shadows were wrong and it kind of made me second guess the shadows of the whole piece. So here you can see me sketching over it trying to figure it out but I actually ended up mocking up the scene in 3D in Blender which made this a lot easier and gave me a much better idea of how the lighting was supposed to work. When I fixed that up I got to work on lumber. I first just started shaping the silhouette. I originally had him standing up and leaning on his axe but I didn't really like it. He looked more like a conqueror or something. So I put him sitting down and looking over the scene and finally I just had him sitting back and taking in the whole view which I think looked a lot more relaxing. To apply the light in, I used the same light source as the rest of the scene, with more light hitting the back of the character. Another benefit of having a simple cartoon character like this is their basic 3D shapes, which is really easy to apply light and shadow to compared to more complex shapes. If you struggle with this kind of thing, I'd recommend just trying to draw some simple 3D shapes in different perspectives and apply light into them. Overall, I kept his colors quite dark because he's much closer to us. I thought that helped give a good sense of depth to the piece. And I also made him quite low contrast and low saturation because while he's an interesting element of the piece, he's not the main focus. The tower is supposed to be the main focus here. To finish refining this, I just kept tweaking the colours and shadows. There's really no special trick here, I just used overall adjustments like brightness, contrast, hue, saturation, and kept messing with things, overall making it more vibrant here. When I'm doing this, I'm actively thinking about how I can drive the focus of the piece towards the tower, and keep that the main area that you initially look at. And adding lumber was still a little bit distracting, so to push the contrast and the character even more in the tower building, I added some more detail with the vines growing up the side. I probably could have kept working on this and refining it for hours, but you gotta call it finished somewhere. You can get a print of this piece in my store. And if you have any questions, then please ask in the comments and I'll do my best to answer. I'd recommend checking out my pixel art tutorial playlist next. Thanks for watching.